Hello, and here we are to go on with the Bible study in Revelation. My, my apologies if you watch this when it comes out. Uh, we're uh, a day late. Uh, I had just quite a lot on yesterday. But I hope that you can join with me in reading, well, finishing the end of Revelation chapter 3 and now going on to Revelation chapter 4. Uh, in fact, when we were together as a group uh, on Wednesday, uh, that also had to be very slightly cut short uh, because... Uh, yeah, I've been juggling too many, too many things this week, but uh, let's, let's enjoy this time together. And as ever, we'll begin with prayer. Let, let's pray. And so, Father, we do thank you. We thank you for time to sit with your word. And as well as what I myself can offer and what each of us can listen to and ponder, we do pray, Lord, that by your Holy Spirit, your word will will take root within us, will speak to our innermost being, our, our understanding of what's going on at this time and our, our desire indeed to serve you. We pray that your word will lead us, lead us into life through Jesus Christ our Saviour. Amen. The book of Revelation is full of dramatic pictures and we'll certainly begin touching on one of those again before I finish today. But it also contains in the early chapters a sense that there were seven letters that this follower of Jesus, John, on the island of Patmos was asked to write. Asked to write, not to write of his own volition, not to write out of his own ideas, but to write because Christ instructed him to write. And in each of these letters there's a, an introductory little section just to remind us who the word comes from, who is this Christ. There's a word to the church and there are seven churches, seven letters. That's not all the churches there were at that time, but also indeed each letter to this church or to that church were to be read by all the churches, were to be heard by all the churches, and that includes, of course, the church of today, our church. And as well as a word to these communities of faith, communities of faith in the past, communities of faith in the present, and indeed in time to come, as long as God uh, gives us grace, there are words for individuals to pick up on, words that may strike just you or me, now or well, at the time that we need to hear it. That is, if we have ears to hear, if we open our ears, if we're ready to hear. Or as another picture in this book quite often uh, uh, repeats, is repeated to say, uh, we need to open the door, so to speak. We need not to, to block out that word that comes from God. So let's read together. We're in Revelation chapter 3, and I think the easiest thing is for me to, to bring it up on the screen. We're beginning to read, as you see, at verse 14. I'll, I'll keep the words on the screen just so that you can follow if you'd like to. And uh, let me read a bit of it first, and then we'll, we'll come back. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, These are the words of the Amen the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realise that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you may become rich, and white clothes to wear so that you can cover your shameful nakedness, and salve to put on your eyes so that you can see. Those whom I love I rebuke and discipline, so be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person, and they with me. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious 
and sat down with my father on his throne. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So this is the seventh and last of these letters to churches in the book of Revelation and rightly famous. I think many people have heard of Laodicea, this letter. Many people have heard of the this business about being lukewarm. And lukewarm does have that sense of, well, yes, literally neither hot nor cold, neither super exciting, neither super vibrant, neither super energized, nor nor doing nothing, nor completely dead, nor just uh, not worth bothering with. Yes, they were about some things, but it just wasn't that dynamic. At least that's certainly the sense we, we leap into in thinking of lukewarmness. One of the rather lovely things about many of these letters is that they, they seem to be geographically really quite, quite, quite clever, if I can put it that way. Uh, that a word to a church picking up problems or indeed picking up blessings in the church, somehow Christ uh, evokes a, a picture that would have spoken very much to the people in that particular place. And, and therefore it's worth knowing, for example, that, that Laodicea as a place is situated, well, in this part of what nowadays is Turkey, and nearby in one direction is the town of Colossae, and Colossae is renowned, was renowned always, for having uh, springs of rather wonderful ice-cold water, which in a very hot country is, is, a, is a wonderful gift uh, to have uh, great cold water coming out of the ground. And uh, so they love the cold water in Colossae. And then in the other direction, uh, uh, I think in the ancient place called Hierapolis, although, but nowadays it's actually a very famous um, uh, tourist attraction, Pamukkale, uh, with rather spectacular... Um, uh, pools uh, that have been naturally formed. Uh, maybe some of you have even been on holiday there to see it. Um, there, there is water that comes out of the ground wonderfully hot, uh, giving you uh, uh, the possibility of having a lovely hot bath in the open air uh, without any need for, for artificial heating. And so what you've got in that part of the world is you've got cold water over here and hot water over here and poor Laodicea in the middle. Well, it doesn't have either hot water or cold water. It's sort of rather in the middle. In fact, perhaps the water in Laodicea was, uh, uh, was far from nice. And if you've ever been given what you thought was going to be a glass of cold water and it ended up being uh, out of a tap that had just been running hot and it came out there for lukewarm, you bleh, you almost do want to spit it out. And so, you know, that language of spitting out of the mouth, it's, it, it's just all part of the picture, yes? Part of the picture that actually has a little bit of real uh, geographical connection. And that's not actually the only bit of geographical connection, as I'll uh, show you in a second. But anyway, it starts off this letter, written as ever to the angel of the church, to the, the one who needs to speak to the church, the church needs to hear this messenger from God, that the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation, are this. Jesus Christ describes himself here as the one who, who says yes, who says yes to the truth that God saves, who is the witness even to death on a cross, Jesus Christ, who is also the ruler set above all of God's creation, set on a throne on high. So his authority is underlined. And, you know, he writes to the light Laodiceans that they're not doing really very impressively at all. They just are not particularly shining. They are not particularly firing. And it's not good. And... We have a little bit of sense of what's maybe gone wrong in verse 17 that, you know, they're actually just jolly comfortable. And, you know, comfort does breed a degree of uh, complacency, of uh, thinking, oh, well, why should we bother? Uh, we're doing fine, thank you very much. And, um, yeah, there's an important word to churches. That churches really need to be rather careful that they don't... Yes, settle down into self-congratulation. The truth is, 
Christ says you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind and naked. Now, yeah, that, those are quite strong words. Strong words now, they weren't literally not wearing any clothes. They weren't actually literally even poor. But in the spiritual regard, they really need to they really needed to look at themselves and to see how how very unimpressive, how very unshining they were. And so what does Christ say? Well, he suggests, well, he counsels, he advises strongly. Buy from me gold refined in the fire. Now, Laodiceans perhaps had gold not quite coming out of their ears, but they had plenty of gold in a literal monetary sense. But actually gold refined in the fire, it's really talking about spiritual riches, isn't it? Uh, about the, the glories of, of what comes through faith through what comes through truly living in hope, depending on God, asking God to guide our ways. There are riches to be found. And white clothes to wear to cover your shameful nakedness. Now, it's not the first time that white clothes have been mentioned. It certainly won't be the last time that white clothes will be mentioned. White clothes symbolically are, 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 are garments of purity, garments that show that we have been washed Washed, as it will say later, in the blood of the Lamb. Washed because Christ died for us. That we might live. That we might live newly. Clothed in white after baptism. They, they did that in the early church. We still, nowadays, very often have those being baptised, dressed in white. One little bit of interesting, interesting information is that in Laodicea, there was a thriving woolen industry. But the woolen industry in Laodicea was because they had uh, a rather, uh, 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 so I'm told, uh, uh, they, had, they had these black sheep. Black wool was the speciality of Laodicea. Now, this is not about black wool being bad or evil, it's not about that at all. But, you know, there's, there's almost a little bit of a, a thing going on there saying, you know, Laodiceans, don't just dress up in your usual wonderful black. Wonderful though it may be in the sight of the world, wonderful though it may be in terms of generating revenue, you need to put on white garments, the white garments of, of faith, white garments that show that Christ has died for you and that you are to live in him. And then the last thing there in verse 18, solve to put on your eyes so that you can see. Well, Jesus, of course, very, very often in life wanted people to see better. But here's another bit of interesting information. Laodicea apparently was quite renowned for its, uh, for its eye, for its eye uh, treatments, <laughs> helping people to see better. But again, there's a little bit of a dig here going on. You know, you think you're good at sorting people's eyes out physically well actually i need to sort out your eyes spiritually i need you to be able to look in the right direction and to look at the one who saves you and to look with love upon one another and so on yes so um rather beautifully there's just little little word pictures that we almost could miss part of the depth of them actually because they're really very particularly pointed at this community in laodicea but but, you know, uh, yes, again and again, preachers will do this. You know, preachers will try to pick up pictures that really mean something to their hearers. Uh, there's no point in, in a preacher speaking about something that is no, in nobody's local or immediate experience, or at least not doing so without, yes, quite a lot of introduction and explanation. But if a preacher can fasten on something that immediately makes people think, oh, yes, okay. <laughs> Of course, I need to think about that. Yes, natural. Yes, but let's just hear Jesus saying, you know, remember, I, 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 I'm sounding harsh, and I will be critical, but those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. Jesus, again and again, works in this mode. He loves us, but that doesn't mean that he is always saying, "You're wonderful." He loves us, but it doesn't mean always he says, oh, I forgive you, who cares what you do? He loves us. And when he sees some of the things we do and some of the things we say, he weeps. <laughs> As a parent might weep 
over their children. So really, you know, he does want us to be, at times, seriously rebuked in order to repent, in order not just to say sorry, but truly to turn around, to turn around our lives. And then we get to this very famous verse 20, and so often it's just sitting on its own. Well, actually, quite rightly, it can sit beautifully on its own. But in the context of the letter to the Laodiceans, you know, Christ is saying this to the whole church. There, there's far too much just comfort, complacency, um, uh, 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 non-responsiveness to the, to the fire, the, the shining light of truth. But if the church can't get it, maybe each and any one of us can get it. Surely you need to realise, you and me, Christ stands literally at our own door and knocks and wants to spend real time with us, wants to live with us, wants to eat with us wants to journey with us. So will we not allow Christ in? It's a very powerful picture. Always has been. People, of course, a very famous painting by Holman Hunt, but yes, very important. Christ wants to be with us. It comes out, this letter, there's nothing terribly positive at all said about the Laodiceans, but does Christ walk away? Most certainly not. He is there, waiting, so wanting people to turn to him. So wanting people to allow that shut door on Christ, that shut door on God, to be opened. And for those who are victorious, for those who who take this on, who persist, who even battle with it, because it will be a battle. Satan will try to distract us. I will give you the right to sit with me on my throne. Christ is on the throne. You can come right alongside me, he says. You will be with me in glory. Whoever has ears, let them hear. So a rather wonderful last letter, I think, the Laodicean letter, and uh, yes, it would have been quite neat to fit it in with the, 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 the other ones that we did last week, but I hope that it's been worth waiting for, because it really is a, a very precious text. And so we moved on to chapter 4, and John, moving on to chapter 4, so to speak, takes us to another way of looking. So if we've been for two chapters now, looking in the direction of this church or that church, but knowing that the word is not just for this church or that church, but in fact for all churches, and indeed for individuals just like you and me. Now John looks, I don't know that I want to think so much as he's looking in a completely different direction, but there is a sense in which he is, because what he's now really doing is he's looking to see where is Christ, where is God? In this world where so much is troubled, so much is difficult, now there's a good question, a very real question for us in our crisis-ridden world. We, this particular week we have got a yeah, pretty major crisis happening all around us in our own country, in, uh, uh, in, the East, in Eastern Europe, and no doubt in many other places. So, so where is God? How do we see God? as sovereign, as in control of what's happening, because actually it feels as if things are not in control, not in the control of God. So John sees this vision, and he sees a vision, or he puts it as, as seeing what will happen after these things. So there is a sense in which he's kind of seeing the future, Yes, I think I have to say that. We have to say that. He is kind of seeing the future, but he's also seeing something that is never going to be derailed. And I think that's critical. Never going to be lost. Let, let, let's read it. Just I, I hope this might help. After this I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. Now remember, we've just come immediately from... Chapter 3, verse 20, with a, a door, a door as were into our lives. How, what does it look like to look through a door that takes us into heaven? If, as it were, we, we are on the, this side and 
and God is on the other side. So, so, so what is what is there? What's what's there with God? Who is God? So he says, and the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet, that's in chapter one, that is, said, come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. And at once I was in the spirit and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and ruby, a rainbow that shone like an emerald encircled the throne. Surrounding the throne were twenty-four other thrones, and seated on them were twenty-four elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings and peals of thunder. In front of the throne seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Also in front of the throne there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the centre around the throne were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes, in front and behind. The first living creature was like a lion, the second was like an ox, the third had a face like a man, the fourth was like a flying eagle. Now I'm going to just take a wee breath there, because, uh, but not because I should, it actually really, really, really keeps on going. But let's just have a look at those two two slides worth, as it were. So, John is privileged to see something of what is going to be, what is truly, as it were, on the other side of that door, which you and I may one day be privileged to enter in. But for now, it's a, a spirit-filled vision. I was in the spirit. And so this is what I saw, but it's almost again, I said when we were looking at chapter 1, which is chapter 4 is a little bit like chapter 1, that there are pictures, he keeps on saying it was like this, it was, it was like that. Now, nowadays, people very often say that word like. Um, they're trying to express something that is very real, but they almost don't have the right words for. And... I think that's exactly what we're meant to, to do. We're not necessarily meant to absolutely tie uh, the thing down to being it was green or it was a rainbow, this sort of, well, what, what sort of rainbow was it? And then a rainbow like an emerald, it's quite hard to know exactly what that was. He, he, he's bombarded with sight. He's bombarded with seeing, seeing glorious colour, glorious things. How do you put into words being in the very presence of God? Well, he wants to say that there's a throne. The ruler sits on the throne that happens on earth. That's a picture of heaven. We don't, we might not get a direct description of the one who is sitting on the throne. He is almost, well, in light unapproachable. He cannot be so easily described. But we will talk about colours that hit us, jasper, ruby, a rainbow that shone like an emerald. Well, the rainbow, of course, in Bible talk is the sign of the covenant, the eternally faithful God, the God who has committed himself not to destroy, but to save. Around the throne, 24 elders on 24 thrones. Now that's a, that, there's a detail to set the commentators going and all of us wondering, is this meant to be something of the, the matching up of the 12 patriarchs of Israel, uh, Reuben and Issachar and Simeon and Levi and so on, plus the 12 apostles, maybe? Or is it actually a bit reminiscent of the 24 who led worship in, in First Chronicles? The commentators tells us, tell us, uh, and we can look it up if you want, um, uh, again, there was 16 plus 8 leading the worship. And it is a worship scene, this. A worship scene in a throne room. Dressed in white, crowns of gold on their heads. <laughs> a vision of how it will finally be, actually not just for 24, but for any. But for now, we can even just see these 24. This is where we are going towards. 
It's very dramatic, flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, lamps blazing. The seven spirits are the sevenfold spirit of God. The, the spirit of God is, is a fire, a blazing light. <laughs> We're taking us back to Laodicea. They weren't really very fiery. They weren't blazing with light at all. In front of the throne, what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. Again, what's that about? Well, a sea, at the very least, is a huge expanse, yes? It isn't just a puddle, it isn't just a little bowl. A sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the ancient world, you know, glass was not clear as crystal, except maybe very occasionally in very, very small, tiny, tiny uh, amounts. They really didn't have the science of glass making sorted out in the ancient world. Glass tended to be quite opaque, quite dark. So, you know, he's he's almost, well, I, I don't think he's reaching for concepts. He's just, he's just trying to explain almost the, 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 the beyond imagining extraordinariness of what he's seeing. And round the throne, four living creatures. Now, just like 24 uh, was perhaps not uh, necessarily everyone who will be enthroned, not necessarily everyone who will be clothed in white, not necessarily everyone who will one day wear a crown. The four living creatures are again just symbolic. They're, they're, they're to remind us of, well, actually, what are they to remind us of? If this is coming from the book of Ezekiel, which it may well be, because there's something very similar in the book of Ezekiel. The lion was thought to be the, yeah, the greatest kind of, uh, 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 fiercest kind of uh, predator uh, 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 animal, yes? And the ox, the, the, the greatest, the, the most uh, impressive uh, uh, domestic animal, yes? And the human being, of course, having a very important place in the in the patterning of creation and the eagle the most impressive the the most uh, extraordinary flying uh, animal creature uh, i think these are symbolic creatures and i think i'm even not quite remembering exactly how uh, how in very early commentaries they, they talked about the lion and the ox and the eagle but yeah, I, I'm pretty sure I'm right on the right track that they're meant to be, as it were, up at the top, the top of their, their kind of species group, so to speak. So again, if, if the elders kind of lead the way on, 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 on the worship front, these creatures lead the way in the, well, on the all living creatures front, being with God. And humanity is in there as well because you and I are part of this whole creation. We are living creatures. We have a particular place within the creation, but we are part of what God has created and we belong very much to the, to the rest of creation and we need to have a good relationship with the rest of creation. It's a very strong theme throughout the Bible. Yes? So I'm just trying to give us a little bit of of, of insight as to what he's seeing, although in some ways we almost just to, need to be caught up in this and thinking, my, this is amazing. And you know, it goes on, and we didn't get to uh, speak very much about this on Wednesday because we ran out of time, but but what it goes on to, as you'll see in verse 8, is that there is a, is that there is a hymn of praise being said, day and night, holy, 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 is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. I'm going to come back to this in the, in the next session, but if I can just jump to the very last of this, again, another hymn of praise. You are worthy, our Lord God, to receive glory and honour and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created, and have their being. So really the summing up of this vision of going through the door to see God and Christ, and those whom Christ has called, and indeed all of creation brought before the throne of God, where God's praises are forever sung. There's something very, very beautiful there for, to, for
for John to hold on to, but actually for us to hold on to also, as we live in this world where things sometimes are so troubled and so chaotic and so we don't know what's going to happen next. There will be a time when we shall see God in his glory and we shall sing to God's praise. And so for now, even for now, we can anchor ourselves in that hope. We can begin our singing, our prayers, even now. Let's pray. You are the Holy God. You are the one with authority over all things in heaven and on earth. And so even just briefly, we bring to you, Lord, our own troubled hearts, our worries about what's happening in the world, our love of one another, and especially of those who are struggling, who are ill, who need blessing. Oh Lord, allow us to be confident that you are all in all. In you, all will be well. May we sing your praises now and into eternity, through Christ our Lord. Amen. <laughs>